Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gaylor on Vancouver's co-op radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one, powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. And good afternoon, Vancouver. Hello, hello. My name is Giuseppe Gensi, and here is my co-host, Mr. Darren Gaylor. Hi, Darren. Hello, Giuseppe. Uh, welcome, Talk Recovery fans, CFRO 100.5 FM. Good to be here. here. On Thursdays, noon to one. Eight years. Hundreds of guests, thousands Eight of listeners. Years. Thank it, you. Eight years. It felt yeah. like we just were saying seven years and that we were just saying six years. Like, what's going on? Well, you know what? I just got to celebrate, uh, you know, for those of you that know, uh, Dylan's five-year birthday yesterday and Michael's is going to be in like a couple of weeks. So, yeah, we're all getting old. <laughs> Beautifully, though, I think. Beautifully, though. So, uh, anyway, we got some great uh, conversations coming up to you for a full hour, powered by New West Recovery. But, uh, hey, we got to talk uh, for our fans of our show. Wow, Vancouver decriminalized drugs. Um, and everyone's saying it's a step in the right direction and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I don't know. I've got dozens of friends that are dead. And uh, the science of the decrim model that's out there is not being followed. And this is like a complete half measures approach to decriminalization. Um, message that I did on my Facebook. Um, do not use the word Portugal, the country Portugal, the Portuguese model, they worked in Portugal in the same sentence as BC's model, because it's completely opposite. It's actually deliberately opposite. Um, and I've done some research, I've done some work, you know, I'm not going to go into my resume on to why, but uh, I've done some research into the Portuguese model. We've talked about a lot about it on the show. Decriminalization, and this isn't Giuseppe's words, this is like the words of people in Portugal, um, the words of the people that created the Portuguese model, their words, decriminalization did not stop Portugal's overdose crisis. Decriminalization did not end stigma. Decriminalization is just a tool to help people access recovery services, including treatment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the reason why this is such a triggering thing is because literally thousands and thousands of people are dead their families are suffering and the best the government can do the best it can do is come up with this bizarre hybrid version that's just we're going to decriminalize drugs everybody and everybody claps so i believe so progressive in, so progressive it's like yeah i'm going to do half of what everybody else does and call it progressive and like celebrate it it's not a step in the right direction it's actually insulting it's stigmatizing it's a disservice to people that are in active addiction and people that are looking for help so here's the reason why i'm kind of choked because i've sat with the minister of mental health and addictions i've sat with dr golau from portugal we've all sat in a room and explained you know, word for word, the Portuguese model would never have worked without the commission of drug dissuasion. And that's the idea of prevention and dissuading and drug reduction. Portugal, you can't light up a joint. You can't smoke crack on streets. You can't, you get tickets, you go to community service, you get, you know, you, you get lifted to do recovery or to not do social disorder on the streets. So here's the thing, right? And then we'll get into our guests. Here's the soundbite. We are decriminalizing drugs to end stigma so people can ask for help. <laughs> okay. So, Where's great soundbite. It's great soundbite. It's a beautiful paragraph. How are they yeah. going to ask for help? Who are they going to ask for? It? Where's the working groups? Where, so you don't want to build a commission of drug dissuasion. I get it. You don't like the word dissuasion. It worked in the year 2000. It might not work in the year 2022. It's been 22, 25 years. 
So create something else. Like, why wasn't there an announcement to say the province of British Columbia is decriminalizing drugs and is creating a network of referral services to get people to help? Training for police okay. officers on how to refer. In Portugal, the police offer refer people to the Commission of Drug Dissuasion. Where is that narrative? So you're going to tell me you're going to decriminalize drugs based on what evidence? Like the Portuguese model? Because that's not the Portuguese model. So again, you know what I mean? Here's the thing. So the only thing I can say to people that are listening and watching, call your MLAs, call who you need to call, because you want to know how are these referrals going to work? Portugal has one phone number. You call it. And everybody in the country gets filtered through that phone number. And they don't care if you go on harm reduction. They don't care if you go to 12 step. They don't care if you go to church. They'll refer you to places that you want to go to. But here, we haven't even fixed that system yet. And they've decriminalized drugs. So who's going to make the referrals? The police? How are they going to make the referrals? So Didn't they just close a, a youth detox down? Like, yeah, 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 they're closing youth directions detox. So they're talking about creating a system where they're going to refer people to. But yeah, we're going to close youth detox. Where's the investment and capacity to actually have these referrals going on? And no one's raising that flag. And that is the the biggest disgrace in that announcement yesterday. Is just what is it? So prove us wrong you know create an entire system of referrals you know and a, and a way to do that in the next six months before the end of january when it goes into full effect i don't know like like you think that that would be part of the plan and you know what else you would think that us us you me the people in this audience at recovery day would demand demand what that's going to be because we don't want our friends to die. We don't want our friends to die. We don't, we don't, we don't want to die. And if you think decriminalization and safe supply is the saving grace to all this, which there is nothing else, what else are they doing? Why can't they create a 1 800 number for the entire province? We're going down through like the whole system is fragmented. You got, you know, all these different health authorities, none of them working together. You have, you know, ways to access treatment. And I'll end my rant here. Friend of mine in jail, asked for help, impossible to get him into a funded bed. They sent him to an SRO, got him on safe supply within a day. He's gone now. Nobody knows where he is. But to get him into, he called. Hey, man, can I get in? I need help. He couldn't. He couldn't even take him because of the bureaucracy. It has to get an assessment by a psychiatrist, has to do this, has to do that. But you know what? We'll send him off to an SRO and, and he's gone. He's absolutely gone. So tell me, Sheila Malcolmson, how your little cute line about how they're not going to get arrested, we're going to refer them to services, is actually going to work. Uh, yeah. You're not, so, not wrong. I mean, no. agree, disagree. It, just look at the, but it's needed, it, you know? Yeah. I mean, who, who needs to be you know, charged criminally and thrown in jail for, for an hour's worth of dope. Yeah, like, and when's the last great. time that's happened? Exactly. Well, that's it. I mean, I mean, I was using over 16 years ago and, and I wasn't, I wasn't being, you know, handcuffed, put in the backseat of the car, driven to the jail, you know, report taken, paperwork done, you know, court date, court date, like, that that hasn't been going on with with a, a a flap of of powder in a pocket for for quite some time now and and for those that have i i mean i guess it just comes down to that you know the discretion of that police officer that you know charged you for 0.4 grams of weed in your pocket right like you know i mean it's just a mess none of it makes sense yeah. and, and and as you say you know, this statement of, you know, the point of this is, is to relieve that that burden of the court of, of, of jail of criminal records. But, but what to, to provide what that's, that's the question out there being posed, you know, where is this help? Where, where are the beds? So to think it's impossible to like be ready to make an announcement of how this referral service is going to work. I mean, changing drug policy is pretty monumental. 
you know, decriminalizing drugs. It's a big thing and it's, it needs to happen. But Alberta announced yesterday that they created an organization called Health IM, which is going to train police officers on how to refer people to recovery oriented systems of care with money to back it up. So, so like this isn't, this isn't impossible. Like this is something that we can actually do, but I'm really skeptical, skeptical why it's not the number one priority. It was in Portugal. They didn't decriminalize and then, oh, we should create this commission. It's like, we're going to create the commission. Yeah. We're going to decriminalize all at the same time so we can get people into the help they need. Yeah. But it's a, it's different here. We, we just somehow Canadians really like to screw up the way harm reduction was intended to work. And, um, you know, I say that because uh, my own personal experience and um, I don't care if you agree with me or not. Like, I know when I use drugs, I didn't care if they were legal or illegal. And uh, I doubt you did either, Jer uh, Darren. And uh, it's... I, I don't I don't see how this is actually attached to the to the overdose crisis. Like, I cannot make no. the, the attachment from decrim to. Dr. Golau and Nuno everybody like we talked to Portugal, they said decriminalization had nothing to do with overdose rates. We well, can't. It, it can't. Nothing. Like just, nothing. just take a moment right now and 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 consider here's the thing. Sheila if Malcolm I don't said, get a, if I don't get arrested for the dope in my pocket right now, how how is that saving my life? And, how, and how is that preventing me from from an overdose? Everybody in BC knows that too. They all came to the conferences. They all met with Dr. Golau. They met with Nuno. They met them all. They they all they all know that. So it would but, be nice for for someone in in Sheila Malcolmson's position to to stand in front publicly on TV and say, "Look, I have no idea." what the solution is yeah and everything we've done so far has not decreased the amount of, of deaths per month and i and i would like to you know build a conference and build meetings and 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 talk and take conversations with those that have ideas and i and i want to and i want to gather them all to see what's best and it's sure. just like well there, well, that's we been got done. this new great idea that's going to help. It's going to save lives. No one said what we're doing isn't working. No one said what we did five years ago was bonkers. Like no one's saying that. It's just yeah. like uh, talking out of our butts. Like we know what we're doing. I mean. So support anyway. decriminalization with some type of response in solving how people access recovery oriented systems of care. Um, that's where the evidence lies. This thing that's happening in BC is not based on historical data from success stories in other parts of the world. Um, you've been, and if you think they do, like you've been misguided We've been misguided. Like, it's just not true. So you're listening to Talk Recovery Radio. Um, yeah, we we're just two addicts kind of like causing some. some, some but, but we do talk, <laughs> talk with success stories. With actual yeah. people of experience. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, we are have a show to do. We have two amazing guests coming up on the show. One is here now with us. We've got Kelly Kane on the show. I'm going to let Darren do the introduction and start the interview. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yes, we are talking recovery with Kelly Kane, uh, educator and Reiki master. How are uh, you? Which doesn't really give it justice, I don't think. I mean, <laughs> obviously you've been a reading specialist uh, for grades kindergarten through 12, um, same school district since 2003, uh, a gifted empath. I mean, you know, working with kids in all different demographics and, and paths of life. Um, and then you were in a car accident, like a brutal car accident. and left you basically square Don't zero have any audio oh she's not uh, able to hear us darren oh no i don't have any audio oh no i can't hear you okay Did yeah you, you, we can hear she you heard she heard us before yeah volume do you have mute yeah she's not on mute what about her computer mute wow 
So, um, there, here's for all of you out there that are listening and watching, you can hit test audio on your Zoom. We're just uh, having a audio situation with our guests. Yeah. We did a test, everybody, earlier, and it worked. <laughs> Yeah, well, we don't want to leave. Uh, I know. You know, the the interview, we want to just give it a chance here. So, uh, again, this is Co-op Radio 100.5 FM. Uh, you were listening to a uh, pre-recorded show on the radio. Uh, and if you are live on Facebook, we are live on Facebook. And you are experiencing our audio malfunction in real I, think time. I think it's just like the first ever. We've never really, yeah, I don't remember can, can anyway. Can you exit her and maybe bring her back and see if that changes anything? Well, I don't want to lose her. Um, we'll, we'll put her in the waiting room. I'm trying to join again. Oh, oh no, we can hear her. Yeah, we can hear her. Yeah, we can hear her. Yeah. Well, while we've got uh, some audio fixes, uh, don't forget, we've got some great events coming up. Recovery Day, which is the big crowd behind me, is coming up on September 10th, so save the date. Food trucks, vendors, kids zone, all that fun stuff, lots of amazing uh, talent. Then we've got uh, a sober lounge happening July 31st, which is going to take place um, in Vancouver on Davie Street at the Shoppers Drug Mart uh and then we've got um what else do we got oh intoxicated intoxicated is happening in new westminster this year and it's going to take place on august uh, 13th on columbia street so that's going to be a huge uh, event for us so i can't wait to show people the uh, posters and so forth because it's truly going to be a great event and then we've also got, um, if you're part of Last Door's family program and Westminster House's family program, we have... Hi, Kelly's back. I have no audio. There you are. I can't yeah, hear, hear her. Well. She can't hear us. Okay. Well, we are having uh, an issue here that I can't fix. I can fix decrim and drug policy, but I can't <laughs> fix Zoom. <laughs> I can, um, can, I mean, she, can uh, she can call in. I'll just give her the phone number and she can call in. How does that work? Zoom. Let me get the phone number. Thanks for being patient. You're probably sitting at home with popcorn watching this, being like, look at these guys. Uh, let's go into this and let's give her the phone oh there's no phone number yeah this is uh, uh just a uh a uh yeah no nope. so what's happening right now is we, our guest cannot hear us but we can hear her and we're just trying to sort that out uh i guess our second guest isn't isn't lined up hey eh? We could maybe do a. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I could probably uh, use. Okay. I could probably give him a text and. Okay, she's. she's oh, got she's gonna try. She's gonna try using her cell phone. Or oh, her, uh, Kelly's iPhone. Uh, I just got a new person to come into the meeting. Hi. <laughs> can you can you hear us now? Uh, do, do I, I have, have you finally? Yes, yes. You what was yes. that? Yes, we have you. Wow, yay. I we got you twice there. now. <laughs> I, yeah, did you see that? Did you see that? Like no, I, that's, I sat here for 30 minutes to make sure nothing went wrong. Nothing at all. <laughs> and I did not get on. So <laughs> of course that... I would sit there all that time. I'm so sorry. Like oh, I, no, it's I, okay. The, the, this is okay. I mean, we've all we've all been through way worse and tougher times, and, um, and with much more stress. To think do, that this is anything comparable to that. Yeah. Do, do I get points for like thinking on the spot and keep trying? Like, exactly. Well, that was good. Exactly. Yeah. That was good because we were trying to give you you know some pointers, but 
all the while realizing you can't hear us. <laughs> I could not hear you. And I was yeah. like, no. And the teacher in me was like, this is not going down like this. I did not sit here for 30 minutes for it to go down like this. That's We're going to fix this. Woo. No, you well, we're here now. Yes. We're here now. And, and I'll just, you know, say we're here to talk recovery with Kelly Kane, uh, educator and Reiki master. Welcome to the show, audibly and, and all other ways. Um, we're going to talk uh, pursuit of happiness, acquiring happiness, finding happiness. Uh, we're going to talk uh, recovering uh, from all aspects as your experience uh, details here, uh, physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, so let's start, Kelly, um, with this accident that you were involved in in 2014, I believe. Yeah, uh, brutal accident. Um, it, I mean, lost the ability to form sentences. Uh, you dealt with uh, brain, a traumatic brain injury, torn shoulder, neck trauma, um, you know, medications for pain, injections, neurofeedback. I, I mean, how, how do you come back from that? Like, this is, this is the story, isn't it? I mean, you, you literally say here, um, like how angry you were that you'd lost your identity. What was I that was like? Here. Oh, I was ridiculously angry. Um, my psychologist actually referred to me as a wild bucking black beauty. Because, <laughs> you know, I have that I'm not going to quit mentality. Obviously, that's how I got everything back. But, you know, I worked really hard for that career for it to be taken, you know, by someone's, you know, lack of better judgment, you know. So, um, yeah, I was very angry. I lost my sense of humor. I couldn't process things. I deemed mentally disabled for one and a half years. So you I tried were being to return. Mentally disabled. As, it was put on as a paper. result of your of your injuries. Now, given that diagnosis at the time, it, it, you know, in in, in comparable uh, situations, was that a permanent diagnosis? Was there talk or potential that you realized of? not when being it, mentally disabled for the rest of your life or I mean what was that what were you told that was the part that was really adding fuel to my fire like of course there was pain that I had going on with all the therapists that I was seeing sometimes I had three doctors appointments a day but the neurofeedback with the brain injury you don't know you don't know for about two years out what you sort of will get back and then it goes from there they say after the four-year mark you know, you see what you're left with. And it, I, I made a good improvement. Obviously, I got my handwriting back, my talking back, but that was a, a, a big attribute to my job supporting me and going to all these uh, rehabilitation places for a year and a half. And then I had to summer off because I was a teacher, right? And then I came back. Right. So no, I'm not teaching Greek and Latin word groups anymore. But I am a fantastic <laughs> kindergarten reading specialist. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's amazing. I, I mean, you know, saying that you you were, you know, starting a new version of yourself, like creating a new version of yourself, uh, I'm sure wondering whether or not there would be any aspects of your previous self again. Like, I mean, what was that first sort of light into seeing and remembering who you were before? And, you know, was that like, was it, what's the question here? Like realizing you're, you're getting well, you're getting better. You're creating a new version. Mm -hmm. Was it inspiring or the opposite when, when some, when you started to feel like, you know, the old versions of yourself, like, did you want to just be, you know, creating a new person? Like what, I'm just That's trying to you know, yeah. imagine this process. At the time, I did not want to create a new version of myself. You know, I wasn't able to rollerblade and I wasn't able to do the karate that I was doing and I couldn't have the same job. Um, and I wasn't understanding, I couldn't even understand a joke. Um, so no, I, I didn't want any of that. It was very hard. So piece by piece, I had to keep going to each doctor and 
I learned, you know, how to rehabilitate, but I also had a driving force. You know, I had a seven-year-old son at that time. So I was pushing hard to get my job back and be that mom. Like that was not going to be stolen from me. And I also had on hand the task of taking care of my parents. I was their power of attorney. So as I'm getting better, they were both dying at the same time. So it was like, hurry up, speed up to heal so you can go help your brother and sister and and help them. So, so I this, had to, to me, I, I and 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 also driving forces to remain the, in a victim state, right? Like angry, resentful, blaming, which you know, when you hear of the story, you know, of of you know the drunk driver you know, doing this to, to someone and, or someone, you know, in your family, like the potential to just, you know, want to see them punished and, and, and not having healing until they have the severe consequences that, that they deserve. Does that have anything to do with the personal healing process? It absolutely does. Because if you can't, you know, forgive that moment and, and move forward, it's going to eat you alive. And I sat in it for a very long time. I had to decide for myself, you know, it, it literally is a day by day process to try and want happiness, you know, happiness is a state. So you have to want it. And it takes perseverance, because you don't always want it. You know, you're sad, you're depressed. I, I don't want to get up and walk. It's painful. I don't want to go to three doctor's appointments today. I just went to four yesterday. It was a very frustrating um, battle. And that went on for a long time, where it's like pulling one of the 14 specialists off. And now we're down to eight. And now we're down to six. And so you could see these increments of healing. Um, but I had to really just learn how to be okay with what I could do. Right. You know what's interesting here, and, and I want to get into another piece on, on, on your bio here, but it's interesting that, um, you know, addiction is considered a brain disorder. Um, you're lucky if you get a counselor, <laughs> you know, you're lucky if you get a counselor, but it's interesting how we treat different illnesses. You know, they say addiction is a healthcare issue, but like, I don't, when I was, you know, uh, needing help, I didn't have four appointments a day. You know what I mean? It's just like, it was hard to even see anybody that even, you know, other than a two minute script writer, which mm -hmm. are dime a dozen these days. It's interesting how we treat addiction and, and how we treat other health issues. And I think that's one of the, the main, the other things of our show is we like to point that out like if you're listening is just like you know if you have heart disease if you have lung cancer you know if you have diabetes you know the the gates open to healthcare. you have addiction and it's like you got three minutes what's your problem here's your script see you later unless you get into like private health care and all that kind of stuff i want to talk to you about uh, reiki you know, it says here you're a Reiki master. So, uh, you know, I went through my phase with Reiki. I was like, that's ridiculous. And then, you know, I needed to, you know, I went and got some Reiki done and I was like, that was amazing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had my own personal experience with that. I don't really do as much Reiki as I'd like to do because I just, uh, you know, back into that uh, don't have time thing. So, so for those of us that are, those of the that are joining us, you know, what is a Reiki master? Um, so I, I followed all the classes. So I actually do this every single morning for myself. I do a meditation, but you know, I know all the symbols to use and I know how to draw my energy in and call in this and very spiritual. So I call in my angels. You do, you do Reiki, you do Reiki on yourself. I, that's why I learned how to do it because I was oh. not willing. Uh, I started it when I was doing my neural feedback because I was unwilling to accept the answers that they were giving me. There had to be a different way to also heal. So I started it then. Um, and I also did the Reiki to help my mom, who also has a gift like mine. Um, she knew she was dying. She was terrified. So I was learning to heal myself, but I was healing her. And then we also used it to, you know, kind of show her, you know, death is an, an okay process and, and take the fear out of dying for her because I lasted for pretty much the eight years, you know, yeah. So, okay. So every morning I wake up and I put on my meditation and I do the symbols and I go through it for about 25 minutes with the meditation every morning. Um, and I will send Reiki, you know, long distance with my friends, but yes, the energy is 
It's real. It's real. It's so, real. So, so what? 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 Can I, what happens? Like what? What is Reiki? So, so a lot of people don't know. What? Like what's happening? Okay. What do you mean? You do the symbols, and you? What are you doing? And what is it? Okay. So when I wake up in the morning, uh, I will say my my prayer first to get you know the good energy coming through. I will say, dear God, Jesus, Mother Mary, our angels, angels, and masters. Ancestor spirit guides and mom and dad because they're on the other side for me. And I will tell them, you know, whatever I really need to have worked on for the, the, the day. Maybe it's a positive attitude because it's not a good day or I know something stressful is coming. Most of the time, it's just I'm asking for love and light and healing. And then I will put on a meditation. Anybody can choose their meditation. I happen to use the Dorian Virtue chakra, chakra clearing meditation that I use for eight years now I started with that you know back and I don't want to change it's like sometimes things that work you don't want to disturb it so I'll do different meditations during the day or night but in the morning it belongs to the chakra for anyone so um there's a chokere chokere symbol I'm going to end up drawing it backwards you know so you say chokere 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 there's a dumo 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 and there's a han chaze for them I can never say it perfectly and that's part of my you know tv on um, and I will do that on, you know, each chakra. And there's sentences that I say out loud to clear that and move to the next one and clear that and set intentions 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 on my third eye and on my crown. So by the time 10 minutes goes by, I've said everything I need to say for positive affirmations for the day. Um, and I am ready to go. So I do that every morning. You know, that goes along with um, the all the specials that say wake up in the morning and have a journal and write um, a sentence of gratitude to put your mind in the correct frame, in the frame of mind. Had to pick that. So you, you got to wake up, and even if you don't feel like you have that positive attitude, you have to do something to kickstart it and i've been on that end where i'm like i don't feel like it up today mm -mm. and i do the the clearing medica meditation and i will you know thank you know the lord or my angels or mom dad or sometimes my cat will come up and be like yeah, i'm loving your energy and i you know take a minute to you know pet the cat just little things you know it's one day at a time and you've got to start the day off right and usually i run right behind it I'll usually run. Uh, I used to be able to run three miles in 20 minutes, but I just hit my head for a second time this week. Oh, no. So, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'm doing just fine. <laughs> well, well, thanks for that explanation. It's like a maintenance uh, of, of your, I mean, I don't want to just call it like, like physical therapy. Like, you know, like this is the maintenance of, of you know, attitude, you know, personal awareness happiness uh good attitudes and and how that correlates with physical pain in the body yeah. i mean i wonder like when you were you know facing these conversations with doctors and and i mean you're essentially crippled both physically and mentally like like what was the health care providing like like physiotherapy like was it them that that offered the the neurofeedback um obviously they're giving you medication Ooh. right like but how how much was it you yourself going no this isn't enough i am going to try this i'm going to do this and and see like amazing results from what you would say unorthodox ways of healing yep so the modern medicine that they gave me is they had my percocet flexoril xanax all of it, you know, at the same time. And I'm a small person. So there were points where they were overlapping and I had to make sure that, you know, hey, I'm going to wake up. That went on for a year and a half. I got the neural feedback, you know, through the system. And the system is very difficult, as you all know. You don't get all these doctor's appointments. I actually happen to be very blessed to get all the help that I got. Um, but the outside attempt that I just couldn't sit with it, that was the Reiki, that was going back to church, that was um, the homeotherapist, oh, no, homeopathist. 
um, that doctor where I got off of all those drugs and, you know, he put me on things like phosphatidylserine and turmeric and, you know, multivitamins. And once I changed that, you would not believe how clear you get. So you're not currently on any medication that was given to you at, at the time. No. And, and, and if it wasn't for your own determination, do you think you would still be? Quite possibly. You and, know. And, and why aren't you on medications? It was, what, what's, the, what's the piece that wanted you to get off the medications? You know, my child was young at the time. And like I said, I was a small person and they were overlapping. And what happens is, you know, you have these heavy hitting drugs going on. And there were points where I was afraid to go to sleep that I didn't think I was gonna wake up. So I would set the timer. If no one was home, I would set the timer on for an hour just to wake me back up. Or, you know, I would have to say to my son, I'm gonna take a nap and you come back in and wake me up and he's only eight, you know, and come in and say, mom, you know, are you getting up? Like that's, I mean, this is forever instilled. And I said, I can't do this to my child. I don't wanna feel like that. And it was really hard because I was in a lot of pain. The brain injury is, is painful. Like it just keeps sending, you know, information all over the place. Like, you know, it'll tell you something hurts, even if it doesn't hurt. It's, it's a very difficult thing to deal with. So I just decided, no, I'm, I'm going to get off of this. It took me longer to get off the Xanax part. I got rid of um, Percocet Flexo right away, but it took me a while to get rid of the Xanax because you're still in that fight or flight mode, you know? Mm. And so, yeah. You know, I, I wish we you know, had more time at the beginning there to, to talk more, because this is a big piece, you know, with, you know, people are just getting lots of medications and there, there, there needs to be like a, because your doctor doesn't have time to do it. He's only with you for a little bit, like education awareness, like how to, you know, get off medications and, and no medical options. doctor is going to refer you to a homeopathic doctor when they when they think that now you're ready to sort of lessen the medication yeah. it's right. your tolerance is building and generally you're getting more medication and if you're, you're on just you know disclaimer if you're on medications it's like don't go off your medications tomorrow no. like everyone's got their own journey and if you want to live your life you know on medications and by all means you know you have that opportunity in this country uh, but, uh, you know, we, we need to hear your story um, because there are other options and other ways and, and it should be just as supported. So, you know, really appreciate you being on our show, you know, bringing that awareness because I know that there's people out there that are on lots of medications. They call our facility and they're like, like, I just can't function in life while I'm on these meds. And, you know, the doctor's like, you have to take them. And, and, and I don't know, I mean, that's not really client centered care. Um, so I really appreciate your courage. Hopefully it helps somebody else um, consider, you know, that their health isn't just with one person, typically a white man too. It's like, there's so many other opportunities for better health. And, and so let's, let's get in, in touch with, with our man, Jordan, for, for another interview, because I think like, you know, if I'm been given, a, you know, one of those bad hands by life, like, a, a, you know, an accident or something like that, like where it's so easy to, to be a victim for the rest of my life and just do whatever it takes to avoid the pain. Like you're the person I need to talk to about how do I how do I become happy again? How do I become accepting of my situation and, and forgive who I so easily blame for my situation. Like that is such an important conversation, I think in all aspects of healing, yeah. because no matter what, we're all facing a very similar dilemma, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, as, as people in recovery from whatever we're recovering. From whatever, from whatever. Yeah, it could be cancer, it could be brain injury. Jordan is our we'll show coordinator. Show. So we'll get Jordan <laughs> to, to bring you back on the show for sure. And somebody wants to get a hold of you. How can they get a hold of you? Instagram, Twitter, you have? Yep, Instagram is angel underscore T-C-H-R. Um, and TikTok and Twitter are Kelly Kane, K-E-L-I-K-A-N-E, -E, number 11. And you can find me that way and I can help you. Awesome. Thanks for being on our show and looking forward to chatting more with you in another show. So take care and best of luck with your, your journey of better health. Thanks, Thank Kelly. You. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye.
And yeah. we now have uh, joining us. Um, he goes by the name Rain. That's his name. Rain. Hi, Rain. Hello. Hello. Can you hear oh. me just fine? I, are you in a car? I am. <laughs> You're in a car. Oh, my He's goodness. on the go. This guy yeah. is always on the go. <laughs> well, you know what? Welcome to the show, Rain. Um, you're listening to Talk Recovery Radio on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5, powered by New West Recovery, uh, a place where Rain uh, started his recovery journey. Um, you know, he's uh, here on the show to talk about his lived experience. We uh, love to bring back people with uh, lived experience on recovery from addiction. So welcome to the show, Rain. You know, we did have a guest a long time ago that was in the car, but she was like a famous actress. Do you remember that show, Darren? I can't remember her name. Famous, but I can't remember her name because I can't remember her name. But anyway, she was you, you remind me of her right now because she was in the car too. So anyway, uh Rain, um, you know, thanks for being on the show. It takes a lot of courage, which we were just telling our other guests to like talk about um, you know, getting well and 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 overcoming the status quo that uh, you know once once you're a substance user you're always a substance user and here just you know replace that substance with something else for the rest of your life so i want to talk to you uh, you know because i know a bit of your story you know um you you you're an, a young hey okay? a young indigenous man um yeah you know what was it like for you to actually wake up one day and say, Hey, I, I need to stop using. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, just thank you for having me and having me be a part of the show. And is it, I think it's kind of funny when you leave, reach a level of fame that you're doing interviews in your car, then that means you made it, I guess. <laughs> exactly. But, <laughs> yeah. We're like letting you do it. We're like, okay, he's good. Yeah. He can do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, um, my life story changed like when I received my ancestral name as a part of our culture, like you're gifted with the name from elders. Mine was Slamu, uh, which means rain, which in turn made me change my name to rain after everything. And uh, yeah, I was unhappy. I was unwell. I was ashamed of who I was, where I come from, uh, being too spirited, openly bisexual. Um, I didn't really embrace any of my part of who I am until I really like started to look at like what the heck is wrong with me and honestly like when I had this little bit of a, a view of what recovery was I'm going to have full transparency I like heard about the recovery I think it was like a, a party boat ride or something that was going around and like this was before I heard about recovery or what it was I thought a recovery boat was for like people like hung over, like they're recovering on the boat. I didn't know it was, <laughs> I had no idea it was like actually like this like recovery thing, like people don't drink on there. And I almost bought a ticket. It would have been so <laughs> awkward if I was that person that was just like, oh, I'm here to like recover and, you know, have some vitamins and cheer my head over. <laughs> Everybody would have been like, welcome. And you'd be like, wow, people are really welcoming here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they all seem so well. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I didn't find out about it until I saw something on Facebook, actually. I don't know too sure how me and you became friends, but it was well before I heard about recovery. I think we met somewhere at one point, maybe. And uh, I started to realize that, like, my life was not going well. Like, I had, a, yeah, I had a business, I had a career, but I was so unhappy. I was drinking all the time, using drugs, and I felt like something was really missing inside. And I approached my, um, my band, I'm from Keatsy First Nation, and I approached them and I was like, I need help. And for my 30th birthday, I'm going to put myself into treatment because I wanted my 40s to be different. I wanted to see who is rain without drugs and alcohol. So I started the process and my file actually sat on their desk for like five months. So I didn't even get any help for the first five months. So I was like constantly like on this like edge of like limbo and like using even more because I was like, well, is there really even any help for me? So I finally contacted our chief and she like immediately got on my case and she started helping me and she gave me a list of treatment centers that were like kind of scattered throughout BC and they're super remote. And yeah, they were like listed as indigenous treatment centers. And I was just like, I don't feel comfortable like being sent somewhere because this isn't the point of it to like go find yourself and like be a part of like a group. And I felt like if I come home, I'm just going to get loaded again. 
So I, I looked online and I found the last door and it was crazy because like I spent like days like looking at um, videos and stuff like that. You guys had a few videos online and I think there was like interviews of past clients. I think um, a couple of clients that work there now actually like they had a video up there. I was like, oh, this sounds like a great place because I'm just that messed up. And yeah, I did my process of intake through my nation. I got supported for funding and I got a bed, you know, I got a room. And to be honest, I, when I got dropped off in treatment, um, I, I, well, first I did a visit and I went to the treatment center and went to go see what it was like. And I came back three days later. I spent those three days just getting absolutely loaded. I'm like, well, this is like, you know my last farewell party yeah your family yeah exactly yeah. i might as well go out with a bang right you bring up yeah. a really important point that i wanted to have a conversation because you have to tread lightly around this conversation sometimes but i like to just go full force um mm -hmm. a lot of people feel um that if you're indigenous um you, I, let's, I'll say it like you have to go to an indigenous program you have to have cultural uh, components to the program that are indigenous and 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 so you have like there's this thing that goes on and in, in, tw in the Twitter world, you know mm -hmm. that uh, you know does your program you know supply support everybody and you know what is your indigenous you know programming and. But the thing is, nobody wants to pay for that, you know, unless you're yeah. like a NADAP facility is like the national Aboriginal services for for indigenous populations. So that's funded through the government through grants. But like mm -hmm. everybody expects treatments like this treatment center last door to have everything smart, life yeah. wearing indigenous, uh, you know, like everything. Um, yeah, but the, the, it's not like they're like paying for it. It's like who's going to pay yeah. for it? Right. So how do you feel about that like where you know indigenous people or you know you need to go here and non-indigenous people go here i mean yeah. i have an opinion about it but i want to hear yours yeah so my entire life i felt like that like even if we look at our like past like generations like we've always been placed somewhere like we've been placed on reserves we've been placed in this identity of who we're supposed to be and like I still feel like that's not right even when I was in school like elementary school they'd be like oh we're going to take the indigenous kids and we're going to give them extra help even if they didn't ask us and then I was just like well it's singling us out and it makes us feel isolated if anything and the fact that you know you're being moved into you know like these I pigeonhole again into another treatment center that could possibly be beneficial for you don't get me wrong there's people that need access to culture and traditions and stuff yeah. but I feel like that there's a there's something to be learned when you're reaching a level of inclusion and when you're like going through these things you're you're wanting to be a part of like everybody else like I found that at the treatment center I went to mm. there was all people of all walks of life and like I found I was able to connect with all these people and it's like it's, it's like, one of those things where it's just like, well, if you don't do this, you're looked down upon. It's like, well, wait a minute. Like, ask us why we don't do this. For example, you know, we're both going to go to Rainbow Lodge for Clean, Sober and Proud Week. And rain is a big part of our pride float. He spray paints our floats yeah. every year for the recovery float. I remember coming into rehab being like, where's your gay program? You know, yeah. and it's like, where's your gay program? Yeah, I need to take care of my gay issues right now. And, yeah. and somebody, you know, talked me through that and said, well, well, like, obviously, some people, like you said, might benefit from a program that's specific, you know, for LGBT. But it's interesting. People are like, oh, then you're not gay friendly. It's like, OK, so we organized the largest recovery float for pride. Yeah. We organized the largest sober pride probably in the world. Um, yeah. but we're not gay friendly because we don't have a gay group. There's a reason why we don't have a gay group. We work with, you know what I mean? So it's just, it's, yeah. and the reason why I'm bringing it up, I'm not promoting where I work. What I'm saying is we need options. We need yeah. options. We need options and let people choose rain. Where would you like to go? Would you like to go to an indigenous program, a harm reduction program, yeah. an abstinence program? They're all great. But we yeah. live in a society where it's like, oh, you have to go to an indigenous program because they don't have indigenous programming. Oh, you're gay yeah. or you're bisexual. Well, you need a gay program. So you need to go here. It's like, hold up a second. 
<laughs> yeah and like you need to have those choices because at the end of the day addiction and like everything else doesn't give a crap where you come from I you're gay straight indigenous black white you name it like it does not care where you're from or who you are yeah and you know like we should be catering to the people like doesn't matter where you're coming from like you deserve to have a chance at this and then have a space where you feel comfortable right like and i got that where i went like i'm not gonna lie the first day i got dropped off at treatment I sat in my bed crying, rocking back and forth. You know, I was probably coming down, but, um, you know, I was just like, there, nobody here is going to accept me. And my roommate was this big black dude named Chris. And he came out of the room and he was like, what's going on? Why are you crying? I'm just like, nobody here is going to accept me. Like, I'm indigenous. I'm too spirited. I'm like crying. He's like, man, if anyone messes with you, they have to go through me first. <laughs> like, oh, okay, I'll stay then. So I literally stayed because of Chris. And Aww. like, I thank him for that all the time. But um, he helped save my life, you know? And like, I Wait, found my yeah. way. People didn't care. Like, yeah, you know? it, it, you, it wasn't the, the fact that you were in the uh, white man's heterosexual treatment center. But yeah. it felt like that, do, you know, for based on your insecurities and, and the shame that you'd brought in there, right? Yeah, and and I'm wondering, like you had to seek through your nation for funding. What was their perspective? Like the 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 woman that that helped you or that that got on your caseload there? Like like was there an offense taken by you not choosing an indigenous uh, center, or or was it totally supported? Like wherever you want to go um it was well first of all the case manager that was handling my file and essentially my file sat on her desk for five months she was fired um but um as you got like, her fired <laughs> I, I didn't do that that was not me <laughs> i'm like she was responsible but like i i've always been an oddball i've always been somebody that i feel like i don't stand out on my own i kind of like i feel like i make different choices and stuff like that and you know, treatment was no different for me. I didn't feel any sense of hesitation because I feel like I've always been like a trailblazer in a way yeah. and like breaking down barriers. And I want to let other like indigenous people know, like you don't have to go to an indigenous treatment center or a facility. Like you can do something different. Like I'm- a She just supported people. your personal choice. Yeah, absolutely. Like the chief, she like helped save my life. She backed me up hundred percent for all of this. And you know, I thank her all the time for it. And it's, it's a huge thing. So rain pride's coming up. Yes, sir. So tell us, you know, how, like, why is that important? You know, is it just a party? Like, what is it? Well, Giuseppe, you were like the one that like really helped me feel comfortable at like the place I was staying at, you know, like it was, and there was these options to like go to these meetings that were for LGBT people. And I started to become be comfortable with being bisexual. And ever since I got there, I've been a part of, you know, clean, sober and proud. And like you found out I was an artist and I had an avenue to paint stuff and I became a part of a team. And now I get to do that with recovery. I share about this in all of my school presentations. Like there's a picture of the clean, sober, proud mural. And I, I talk about what recovery is in elementary schools in high schools. And I'm sharing like, it's okay to like be messed up in drugs and alcohol, but there is answers to find it, you know, like if it's not working for you, find that answer. And Clean, Sober and Proud is like an inclusive area for people to be okay with being gay, straight, trans, you know, you name it. And like you have space and like you have somewhere you can go because the gay culture is heavily influenced with drugs and alcohol. Like, you know, like everything that I've seen so far or experienced was just like, if there's a party, there's gonna be drugs and alcohol and a few blackouts and then you wonder why you feel like crap. <laughs> Right. And with a this few program, blackouts, yeah, some blackouts. So yeah. this year, this year, we're going to be uh, building a recovery float again. Uh, there's a Facebook group called Clean, Sober and Proud that you can yep. uh, look for in the search on Facebook or DM us or whatever if you want to get involved. Uh, Rain and Tyler, we can't forget about Tyler. Tyler and Rain Ooh. are, are artists. Uh, yeah. Rain, I mean Rain, uh, Randy and Scott are the uh, lead carpenters with Dave Leesk. And uh, we're going to put together the return of the recovery float, you know, because of COVID, we haven't been around for a couple of years. We've been doing yeah. murals, but this year the mural is going to be on a 
on a truck uh, for our yeah. folks. So we're really excited to get back into that. We're not going to let anybody can't tell. No, top, not top yet, secret. Eh? Yeah, that's you, yeah. you got to be in with the crew to know. Yeah, you got to be in with the crew to know. I so. almost spilled the beans. But. Oh my God, no, no, no. Not yet, not yet. Way too early. I should have yeah. asked me, um, <laughs> because I got clean during COVID, so I didn't get to experience it like all this cool stuff that's about to happen and i've heard rumors of how great this event is and like how many people it impacts and how the float is pretty much the best one in the entire parade well, you um, know. i'm super <laughs> excited to be a part of it and just like to be standing and dancing for hours you know yeah in recovery it's definitely a good time so yeah that's going to be coming up the pride parades july 31st the return of the pride parade and i will be doing a recovery float in that pride parade everyone's welcome to come march with us you know and be part of it and the whole goal is to remind people like recovery is not just stop using like recovery is mm -hmm. life recovery is fun recovery is 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 an opportunity to actually go to the parade and remember it and all that and then we've got all of our events happening in the evening and you're a big part of that rain so i really appreciate you doing that um Absolutely. so you know someone's listening to the show and they're um struggling and whether it's the yeah. mom the sister the family member the uncle or the person themselves and uh, they're from an indigenous background and they just feel you know just not part of um, and and trying to find a way out. Uh, what words of advice do you have? And by the way, uh, you know your 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 recovery story is a few years now. So so what advice do you give somebody? What is it today? Yeah, it was two years, two weeks ago. Two years, um, two weeks ago. Sober. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, if you're struggling and you're out there and you're wondering, is there a better life for me? And are you? If you have any level or curiosity of what is your untapped potential? You know give recovery a try whether that's going to a meeting whether like go to one meeting check it out and like try to meet some people but continue to go to a couple or reach out to a treatment center and see what they can offer you because you know they are pretty inclusive the ones that i've seen so far and you know like find what works for you but all i know is for my for my own experience life does get better and you will reach potential that you had no idea you even had inside of you like right now I'm traveling the world. Like I'm going to Austria July 1st, like going for an artist fellowship. I'm writing a book with Staples. It's going across the country. My business is just thriving. And like, I would not be able to reach this capacity if I didn't have recovery in my life. And not only on top of that, like I have my family back. You know, I, I'm with my dad right now. He's like here with me and we're actually like um, visiting some family for like a funeral and stuff. But like, you know, recovery keeps me like tied to everybody. Recovery kept, keeps me going and stuff like that. But if you're seriously struggling, just know that you are loved. You deserve a chance at this world. And if you tried all the other options, at least try this before you like throw in the towel. Because exactly. Keep trying you know, and keep trying yeah, and keep, keep trying, trying and keep trying. Yeah. So Rain is a successful yeah. artist. So Rain, what's the website? Where can people find what you're doing, where you're at? Uh, so my website is uh, www.rainawakens.com. Uh, all my handles are Rain Awakens. Um, follow my story on TikTok at Rain Awakens. I do stuff on recovery, artwork, and what it's like just to be yourself. I'm a huge and advocate of love yourself and see who you can be, you know? And, and before we end the show, and then I think Darren's got one thing he wants to add, but I just got to give props to your hairstylist, Chris B. Chris B, yeah. yeah <laughs> Just, I'm looking at the hair, loving it. So <laughs> I know Chris would love that. So, you know, Chris B is becoming the, the next generation of, of hair extraordinaires. So, yeah. so, so good hair there. Good. I wish I had some, I wish, but good hair there. Yeah. Darren? I uh I mean, I'm just the, like today's show, I, it just reminds me and inspires me of, you know, like whether it's the world that's been telling us that, you know, we're not worth it, and, you know, we don't deserve whatever, or if it's just ourselves, like that there's, there's a way of self-actualizing whether that's true or not and deciding for ourselves. Like I, like I love the, you know, you, you've, you've, you've honored the oddball, you know, yeah. That, that is that is you and, and it's nothing to be ashamed of and it's nothing to get rid of it's only something to love and, and cherish right and sometimes we just need to know that there's there's other people that will love and cherish cherish it with us you know yeah that, absolutely. It, that it's not just going to you know 
be the one thing that everybody berates when I walk into a room. And that might've happened. That might yeah. be some rooms that we walk into, but Hey man, let's, let's find the other rooms where it's loved and cherished and, and then just, you know, stay, stay there. Absolutely. <laughs> So and, like, and stay because you're welcome to stay. You're listening to Talk Recovery Radio. We come to you live every Thursday, noon to one. Hope you like what you hear. And if you don't, we're still going to keep saying what we say. Uh, Talk Recovery Radio is uh, on YouTube. Hit subscribe. Like us. Follow us. We're, we're playing on all your favorite restreaming. And you can hear all of our archives at Talk Recovery radio.com rain good to see you see you more see darren you. see you more take care everybody and thanks vancouver co-op radio bye bye bye, bye.